rebel force has penetrated the shield and landed on Endor. This is where the fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Well, I think we use that power for good here. We are the ultimate power in the uh, Star Wars universe when it comes to podcasting, that's for sure. And with that power comes great responsibility. And I think we use it well. Certainly going to use it well this week here on RFR. Great to be with you. Thanks for hanging with us. I've been really looking forward to this week's show. I always look forward to the show, but there was something about coming into this week... And some of the news we're going to be talking about, some of the topics. Looking forward to breaking it all down with you. We've got some updates on two of the forthcoming Star Wars films, the Daisy Ridley film, as well as the Taika Waititi helmed film. So that'll be coming up in uh, in news. Also some, well, maybe some bad news. Uh, there's a possible delay in the release of Andor Season 2. There's some good sources that are saying that that is not going to make it. Uh, when Tony Gilroy, make it to Disney Plus when Tony Gilroy promised, which was August 2024. Uh, also, interview highlights coming up with young Ahsoka, Ariana Greenblatt. We've got uh, Adam Driver and Natalie Portman. We've got these clips from them. Oh, man, it's great. It's great to have these stupid strikes over and have real news coming in. Um and, uh, and 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 some stuff uh, to talk about, some new stuff to talk about. Plus, Star Wars and pop culture. If we have time, that'll be back this week. We got to take it, you know. We got to go with the flow because sometimes we get on a we get on a roll with these news stories or a voicemail, and you know we don't have time to get through it all. But we're certainly going to do it, uh, give it a try. And by we, I mean of course myself. My name is Jason, and with me, as always, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. So excited to be here talking with you guys as we're on the eve of the release of Rogue Squadron. Hitting cinemas <laughs> this month. Rogue oh, Squadron. Jim, 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 Jim. Maybe you didn't hear. Uh, it's it's not happening. Rogue Squadron, the the, the Patty Jenkins film that uh, Kathleen Kennedy announced a couple years ago and gave it like a release date. Yeah, it's not happening. What? Well, yeah. I, well I called movie phone and I got my tickets. <laughs> I don't know what number you called, and I don't know what tickets you bought, but (laughs) (laughs) maybe you called Patty Jenkins' house by mistake. They they routed you over there. No Rogue Squadron. No. None whatsoever. But there is news about uh, other Star Wars films that seem like they're in the works, and news about uh, things we might be seeing in 2024. Yeah. Some confirmations. Well, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I think a confirmation coming from Lucasfilm is something you can really take with a grain of salt. You know? <laughs> Are we? Have, wait a minute, have we reached that point? Oh yeah, where so even yes, the indeed we press have. releases, oh, we, yes. we got to go. Eh, it's still fifty fifty. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm definitely of the school. Of, you know, like when I have my tickets in hand and I'm waiting in line to walk into the theater. My tickets on my phone, or however we're doing it, right in the year twenty eighty, or whenever the next Star Wars film is going to drop. Only then will you believe it, right? Well, see, I, you know, Bob Iger is is talking about how uh, these film sets need uh, more corporate executive presence to make sure everything runs smoothly. So, uh, so yeah, I think twenty eighty is a, a fair <laughs> date to be. By the way, I want to ask calendar. Bob. I want to ask Bob about when has that ever worked. When has more bureaucracy and corporate executive oversight ever been the solution to anything? Yeah, I'd love yeah. to know. I'd love to yeah. know. He did make the, that comment, though, earlier yeah. this week in when he was talking. He was at a summit, uh, some sort of filmmaker summit, and he was talking about uh, the box office flop of the Marvels. And I, I just, you know, I, I think that's so unfair to throw professional filmmakers— Directors, producers, and 
crews of hundreds of people, just throw them all under the bus and say, you really needed a suit there with his arms folded, watching everything. Yeah. With another Counting suit standing beans. next to him with a clipboard and scribbling right. something down on it. No, yeah. that's not how that's not how the process works, Bob. So take that back to square one. No, it's amazing how such a such a veteran of the entertainment business and 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 being a leader, you know, maybe these guys just eventually I think this does happen. I think they just start over time. Believing their own press, drinking their own Kool Aid, whatever. I think that that's they convince themselves that they are the critical element. Yeah. To having overseen and stewarded some great stuff. I mean, Bob Iger's career is it's a phenomenal career. He's had a lot of successes, so it's easy to just come in and say, "Oh, you know, this guy's." That's what makes it so befuddling is that this is not a dumb guy. This is not somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience. Uh, right. He's got tons of experience, but man, is this a wrong-headed thing to say? Or I, I just doesn't seem to make sense to me. But well, I think Mr. Iger went off the rails when he stopped calling us on a regular basis. So yeah, what's uh, with Bob that? Iger? If you're out there, we used to relish those those updates you would give us at the uh, on the RFR voicemail hotline. And uh, we're not getting them anymore. So uh, I, I hope you're okay. And uh, maybe we can... Uh, you, you can hear some of those calls, actually, on our YouTube channel. We have the best of Bob Iger. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Iger in quotes, I think, as it is right. on the YouTube. I I'm hope so. To cover us legally, that's for <laughs> sure. Hey, just a quick shout-out. I did get my uh, Blu-ray copy of a, of a Disturbance in the Force. Great documentary that we've been covering here on RFR by Steve Kozak. Uh, Jeremy Kuhn and Kyle Newman, who uh, were on the show last week, and Adam F. Goldberg, all attached to this. It's awesome. I've been hearing from uh, people that have discovered it on some of the streaming services, but I really wanted my Blu-ray, so I've got it, and uh, highly encourage uh, everyone to check it out. It's very fun. Have you popped it in the player yet? Not yet. This weekend. Can't wait. Okay. Can't wait. So I only saw that first cut. I have not seen the final cut. Lots of differences. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of differences. The final cut is slick. Yeah, and, and a really good time. So there was some concern that because of the demand on the Blu-ray that they didn't really see coming. They figured well, people are just going to stream the thing. But there's been significant demand for the physical media behind a disturbance in the force. So uh, there were fears that the warehouses wouldn't be able to keep up with it around the release date. But most reports I've been hearing is people who ordered it are receiving it. And that's good news. Yeah. I got it a day later than all of the other December 5th drops and Jeremy and Kyle sort of tipped me off that that might be the case. So yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're dropping. Uh, All right. Well, it may not be Bob Iger, but let's see who is on the voicemail line as we uh, check in with a little mail call. You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message after the message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. It's a trick. Send no reply. Hey, Jason and Jimmy. Um, I just had something. I was re-watching the original trilogy, and Chewie seems to have a really inconsistent view of the Jedi. Okay, so in the original Star Wars, when Obi-Wan's running off to get rid of the tractor beam, I guess, Chewie roars, basically, and you interpret him as being critical of the Jedi because Han says, oh, you said it, Chewie, or he said something like, oh, you said it, Chewie, where did you guys dig up this old fossil? Okay, Return of the Jedi. When he's in the dungeon with Han, he's very complimentary of Luke's ability as a Jedi to rescue them. Okay? Revenge of the Sith, it turns out he knew Yoda and helped save him from Order 66. Okay? So, there's inconsistency there, and I'm wondering, for example, when they're in the cantina, uh, before Obi-Wan pulls out his lightsaber, I'm wondering, first of all, what they talked about, and whether or not they knew that they both knew Yoda. So there's a lot of questions I have about this. Um, I was just kind of, I know these movies just kind of get made and things get changed or retconned or whatever the term is, but I'm just curious if you guys had any thoughts about about Chewie's sort of inconsistent view uh, of the Jedi, since presumably he knew them beforehand 
and then he was kind of critical afterwards. Um, so just let me know. Uh, this is Gary from Miami, a uh, long-time listener. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. I guess he's not familiar with uh, Chewy's nickname, which is the Flip Flopper. No. Uh, Chewy's run for political office at various times. They've always con- <laughs> thrown that accusation. He flip flops on every issue. No, yeah. I thought this was a. It, it, when I first listened to the voicemail, I go, "Okay, I, this is this is easily explainable." And but I thought maybe there's more to it. So I grabbed what I consider the Bible, which is the Star Wars annotated screenplays, because mm. I couldn't remember Jim if they had given Chewy dialogue within the notes of the script. As uh, the, they don't, <laughs> so I've got the I've got the script. I couldn't remember, but uh, so here it is. Ben, they must be delivered safely, or the star systems will suffer the same fate as Alderan. Your destiny lies along a different path from mine. The force will be with you always. Ben steps out of the command office, then disappears down a long gray hallway. Chewbacca barks a comment. <laughs> And Han agrees. Boy, you said it, Chewie. Han looks at Luke. Where did you dig up that old fossil? All right. So it's open for interpretation, though. We don't know what Chewie said. Han just says, well, you said it, Chewie. And then he looks at Luke and says, where did you dig up that old fossil? I don't think it's necessarily, you know, Chewie could have said something like, oh, boy, he's really asking for it. Or, wow, that guy, uh, I don't know what's going on with him. You know, he's taking a big risk. So it doesn't mean he didn't say that what's going on with this crazy old man, or how could we have possibly followed this old kook into the, uh, into this space station. Uh, so the old fossil line, I don't think is necessarily uh, in any way related, I guess, to what, uh, to Chewie's opinion necessarily of, of old Ben. Okay. It's a lot of lot to unpack here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take it line by line. The first one oh, we would talk I have about so is so many thoughts on this. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm also looking through my archives to try to find a very specific outtake from A New Hope, in which it's revealed that while there was no dialogue for Chewbacca necessarily outside of growls in the script. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Oftentimes, Peter Mayhew would articulate English words for Chewie on the set. And that scene you're talking about specifically is available as an outtake. And Peter says, that old man's mad. That's what Peter said. So I'm I'm looking here, Peter Mayhew outtake. Let's see what this. Is. I think I I think I've got it right here. As a matter of fact, I think I got it. Action. That old man is mad. You said it, Chewy. Boy, where did you dig up that old fossil? Ben is a great man. There yeah, great at getting us into trouble. I didn't hear you give any ideas. That old man's mad. Yep, there yeah. it is. So there mystery is. solved. What Chewy's saying. Okay. Well, I mean, can we consider is that can- Peter Mayhew's is can- English ad libs for Chewbacca on the set canon? That that's a slippery slope right there, my friend. Well, but it had to have been now th- those those lines. I don't think were just random. I think they had to have been in the script or in a note or in 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 something that was passed on to him, or a conversation between Harrison and Peter before the cameras rolled. That could be too, you know. It, yep. it might have been Harrison feeding Peter lines prior to shooting, just so because Harrison would be more comfortable playing off of someone doing other, something other than growling. I, I could see Harrison Ford kind of drawing a line there. All right, listen, yeah. Peter, you're not going to be barking at me throughout this whole thing. All right, I'm going to tell you what to say. All right, so this old man's <laughs> man here. All right. And then I'm going to lean up against you. So don't think I'm falling down or anything. I'm going to lean against you. Don't back off or else because I'm wearing all this plastic (laughs) crap. I'm going to fall on my ass. (laughs) Okay. So, well, let's say, let's just, for the sake of this discussion, let's say that's canon. That was some sort of official note. That doesn't necessarily indicate some sort of uh, general feeling that Chewie has about the Jedi. He might just be saying, hey. He's crazy. Doesn't mean the Jedi are nuts or I don't trust the Jedi or anything like that. 
See, this this is perfect, uh, the way this is all unfolding. Because Chewie, yes, he served with Jedi in the Clone War when they attacked Kashyyyk. Obviously, right. we all know that Yoda was the general out there. He said he had good relations with the Wookiees. He obviously knew Chewbacca by name. He refers to him as Chewbacca. And obviously, Chewbacca knew Yoda by name. But here we are, 20 years in the future. The Jedi are all but extinct. Oh. Han and Chewie have been traveling the galaxy dealing with all kind of stuff. Thus, Han grew into kind of a cynical guy, a cynical smartass by the time we catch up with him at the beginning of A New Hope. And Chewie... Sharing those adventures with Han probably also developed quite a cynical edge himself. And they clearly did not run into any Force users or Jedi in the period of time between the Clone Wars and A New Hope. Right. No, they did not. I'm even thinking about the Solo film. There were no force no. users in that film, except for the, the weird appearance of Darth Maul at the end, but there was no interaction between him and Han and Chewie. So Chewie's been traveling the galaxy with Han. He, they haven't run across any Jedi or force users, and Chewie knows all about Order 66. He was there, he for believes, God's sake. By the time they're on the Death Star or wherever, in, in A New Hope, Chewie is firmly convinced that the Jedi are indeed extinct. And they're very cynical about Obi-Wan Kenobi. I think it is Ben who makes the first connection with Chewie at mm-hmm. the Moss Eisley Cantina, but I think that was all in like a very utilitarian way. I'm looking to, to hire a ship. I need to be flown to Alderaan. I don't think there was any talk about Jedi or Force. Ben kept all that stuff on the down low. Right. Because he right. knows he was being hunted. He knows that he was a marked man by the Empire and the Sith. He wasn't going to start revealing himself to some weird furry alien at uh, the Moss Eisley Cantina. And also, how would Obi-Wan know that Yoda knew Chewbacca? Because they split up, you know? So it's not like, uh, you know, Yoda was telling him about these Wookiees he served with on Kashyyyk. The war had been going on for several years at this point. They were serving with a lot of different soldiers, a lot of different planetary armies and whatnot. So... By the time Ben Kenobi rolls in, Chewie is cynical just like Han. And Ben has done nothing except handle the saber really well in in the cantina. Everyone saw that. Mm -hmm. But that still doesn't necessarily mean he is truly a Jedi. They think he's kind of nuts. Ben is known as sort of a nut job on the planet Tatooine. The crazy old wizard. Him. Yeah, crazy old wizard. Right. So nobody's really buying his status as a Jedi, nor is Ben trying to sell that to anyone. Ah, uh, so this is this is what Chewie says by way of Peter Mayhew's perhaps ad libbed line, but let's, yeah. let's let's say it wasn't. He's making a remark about Obi this this guy Ben Kenobi, not Obi Wan Kenobi Jedi Knight. He doesn't no. have any idea. Uh, he can't confirm whether this guy is a Jedi. As you said, for all he knows, the Jedi are all but extinct. Yes, and Han and Chewie, who knows how many Jedi pretenders they rolled across over the years. Remember? And we know from Kenobi that yes. the Kenobi series that Jedi pretenders are a thing in Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, con men, what have you. So um, there's a lot going on in the galaxy. And a lot of time has passed between Chewie's last interaction with any Jedi. So by the time Ben is facing off with Darth Vader, Vader swings the saber at him and Ben, poof, disappears. Then... These guys are probably on board the Falcon. Yeah, they're fighting for their lives, so they don't have much time to sit around and chat about it. But they're freaked <laughs> out by the fact that the old right. wizard, did he disappeared. There's something special about this guy. It's clear. And then Luke blows up the Death Star. Did he share that he was hearing Ben's voice in his head? 
Did he share that with Han and Leia and Chewie? Did he share that? Or did he just keep that to himself? I don't think that's something that he would bring up. Right. <laughs> I hey, don't guess what happened to me? So uh, then the years go by. Uh, three years into Empire Strikes Back, and Luke goes off to study with Yoda. Yeah. Chewie has Did no knowledge Luke, of this. Luke never told Han or Chewie or even Leia where he was going. No, the only thing that Han might have heard those uh, mumblings that Luke was letting out. Uh, Yoda. 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 <laughs> but who's to say Chewie <laughs> ever mentioned Yoda to right. Han Solo? Unlikely. Unlikely. Yeah. Unlikely. And, you know, I listen... I've had family members who have been veterans of even the big one, World War II. One in particular who is still alive to this day and sharp and can remember things. And he's not so open about his war experiences with well, just that's anyone very true. Yes. at just any time. Right. When they start talking, it's rare and it's, it's serious. You can see emotions coming to the surface again, even after all of these years. Right. So... Veterans of wars don't necessarily just throw out details about what they experienced, yada, yada, to just anyone. I know Han and Chewie had a great relationship, but that doesn't mean that Chewie revealed every individual he served with during the attack on Kashyyyk throughout the Clone Wars. Right. I mean, um, the, the only thing he might say is... That he yes, that he was there at the Battle of Kashyyyk and he yeah. helped a Jedi escape. Right. But I don't think beyond that, hey, I once helped a Jedi escape on Kashyyyk. Yeah, you know, it was crazy. All the clones turned on him. He jumped on my back like a monkey, and then I took him to a shuttle and never saw him again. <laughs> and he farted. You know? Oh, that oh, was yeah, the there. <laughs> there was supposed to be a fart in <laughs> a Yoda fart in yeah. Revenge of the Sith. And I think it got pretty deep into production too before thankfully got edited out and it was on Kashyyyk. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. So now Luke has gone off and trained with Yoda and Han gets taken captive by Boba Fett to be delivered to Jabba the Hutt. So those two guys are separated. Luke comes back and he starts impressing Chewbacca, obviously mm. with his, his newfound growing force abilities. He can now command the force like none of his friends or rebels have ever seen before. And he has a certain mastery over it now. At some point between Empire and Jedi, Luke and Chewie discuss Yoda. And Chewie realizes, oh my God, Luke is the real deal. He is the next Jedi, you know? He's, mm. he's going to continue. So that's why when Han blinded, Right. Reunites with Chewie in Jabba's dungeon. He's like, a oh, Jedi Knight? Everybody's got delusions of grandeur. And then the scene ends. That's when Chewie starts going, oh, no, 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 no. He served with Yoda, who <laughs> I served with during the Clone Wars. He studied under Yoda. He's He 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 took on Darth Vader. He did all of this stuff. And he's done. he did all this stuff in the year between the year you've been frozen. You should hear all this stuff. He's done. So Chewie's sold on it now. And it all lines up. Well, you it sold all me. Lines up. So you Chewie's sold. not flip flopping. He's just going with the flow, evolving, dealing with reality is what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah you know, he, I mean, obviously he was aware of the Jedi, but remember also in the age of the original trilogy, um, the Wookiees were rare, most of them were enslaved. Yeah. Jedi were rare. Wookiees were rare. So Chewie had a lot, a big target on his back. So the last thing he wants to be doing as a species who is largely enslaved by the Empire is going around talking openly about his experiences with Jedi Knights. That'll put a bigger target on Chewie's back. You know, as I'm thinking about this, you know, I could have sworn, and that's why I grabbed the annotated screenplay, because... There was a part of my brain that was saying, there is dialogue in this scene. There is dialogue in this scene from Chewie. And that's what I was thinking about was that, was that outtake. There's outtakes of Peter 
talking behind the mask. There's outtakes of Dave Prowse speaking through, you know, through the helmet with his Welsh accent and all that. So, yeah, amazing. I, I do want to, there's one other little twist that this investigation that I was uh, feebly trying to wage led me to, because I wanted to get something from George about connecting Chewbacca with Yoda and why that was important. So I, I grabbed this book, which I love, the Star Wars Archives for uh, episodes one through three. This came out in um, 2022, and there's a big, beautiful, large uh, coffee table version, and then there's a more uh, manageable version, which I have here. So I'm looking through this book because, boy, Paul Duncan, who wrote it, just did an amazing job in his interviews with George. You know, we're talking about post-sequel trilogy. We're talking about post uh uh, fallout of the reception of the sequel trilogy when Paul Duncan was talking to George. And that's really special. So I was looking for the Yoda stuff for episode three, and I didn't find that, but I found something else that I thought was really cool and speaks to a conversation that we've had many times here about midichlorians and what effect midichlorian count has for being a Jedi. And here it is. This is the question from Paul Duncan. He says, at the end of their duel, Obi-Wan is so personally attached to Anakin that he couldn't kill him. He couldn't bear to see him die. George, he's human. The Jedi are not superheroes. They're regular people like the rest of us. We all have midichlorians. We all have the force within us. We can all do what the Jedi can do, but we're not trained. And the secret is training. You need somebody to train you because it won't come by on its own. You don't say, oh, gee, I think I can see the future now. It's a fallacy that you can get something for nothing. If you have the talent and you work and work hard, then you'll achieve something. But if you have the talent and you don't work hard, you won't. So, Jim, this does, uh, I think, confirm where we've sort of ended uh, some of these discussions after Ahsoka and talking about Sabine and how does she and 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 all of that. And we got George right here as, as late as the, you know, early 2020s confirming that midichlorians aren't everything and they're in all of us. And the secret sauce is training. And something else I'd like to throw in the mix too, is the balance of the force, which seems to me to be a really important thing, considering how the Jedi were talking about it. Like it was everything the balance of the Force. There are times when the Jedi can connect to the Force better than other times, and that depends on the influence of the dark side on the galaxy. So when we deal with the Jedi in the prequels, the Force is unbalanced, tipping, tipping, tipping toward the dark side, and it clouds everything according to Yoda. Then what happens in Return of the Jedi? Luke redeems Darth Vader. The rule of two is shattered, and the Sith Master gets destroyed, well, at least for a time being, <laughs> bringing balance to the Force because everyone looks at Palpatine's death as being the thing that balances the Force. But I disagree with that. I think it's the redemption of Anakin Skywalker which shatters the rule of two, which is the main thing that was tipping the balance. As Darth Sidious was starting to attract stronger apprentices from Darth Maul, who was just a fighting machine, and maybe not necessarily super strong in the dark side, but he sure could brawl. <laughs> and then you have Count Dooku, who not only is strong in the dark side, but he's also a master Jedi. Someone who is, you know, extremely knowledgeable of the Force and very connected to it. So by the time Yoda and Mace are talking in the prequels, and Yoda says, uh, everything's clouded, I, that's the Dooku effect, I think, big time. Mm -hmm. Because Sidious got himself a really strong apprentice. Then... He lured Anakin Skywalker, who became Darth Vader. Then that just blew the force way out of balance. 
way out of balance and the Jedi were hunted down and with every Jedi death, the Force tips more and more toward the dark side. And then what happens in Return of the Jedi? The Sith Master gets destroyed, his apprentice regains the light side and the Force becomes balanced. Thus, the Force becoming more accessible to people who have that talent, who have that connection. So it, making it possible for a Sabine Wren to suddenly start feeling a connection mm. to the Force. Yeah, right. But but Ahsoka was failing with, with Sabine throughout the original trilogy period of time when she was training. I, I assume it was during the original trilogy period of time. Um, maybe just before, uh, but maybe during, I don't know. So confusing, so good. <laughs> um, but because the force was still so unbalanced, massively unbalanced, it was like really impossible for Sabine to connect with the force. And she was getting angry and frustrated with it. And Ahsoka stepped back. And she's like, well, you know, nothing's happening here. I don't think Ahsoka understood the force being so tipped out of balance. You know, well, how do you tell? How do you tell? You know, I, I have a I have a little bit different take on why Sabine might have struggled. And no, there's no right answer here. But my take on it could be, you know, what we know of Sabine is that she was blessed with a lot of abilities. She, she's extremely smart. Uh, she's extremely athletic, very coordinated, great fighter, well-trained in everything. Physically. Right. So I'm wondering if somebody like that, that is so reliant on their body and what their body can do might stumble upon the head game. You know, you think about athletes, some athletes are really, really great, but they, you know, some golfers I think of are, are, are incredibly physically, but they, they don't have the mental stamina guy like Tiger Woods was famous for saying that it's, it's 90% mental, the game of golf, for example. So could a Sabine have been maybe arrogant we know she is she's brash super independent i don't need no force i don't need not she may have struggled giving herself or uh, giving giving herself over and letting go that could have been a challenge for her yeah definitely but now she's got her first taste yeah she made that lightsaber fly up in her hand she was able to force push ezra and the thing so now she's got a taste of it so i could have come through humility you know she she suffered a quite a quite a loss in a sense she she went against her master's wishes. She essentially betrayed her master and went against what Ahsoka wanted. And so she's kind of at a, at a low place and she's desperate. And perhaps that's what makes her faith so strong in that moment. What a great voicemail yeah. from Gary from Miami. He's really opened up a lot of discussion here. There's just one last thing I want to add to the whole uh, Chewbacca um, and his his belief in the Force and then his cynicism about the Force. Is he flip-flopping? In? No, I think that all comes down to evolution. Evolution of, of the galaxy, evolution of the reality surrounding these characters. Uh, Chewbacca's in a very different place two decades after the Clone Wars when we catch up with him in A New Hope. And, you know, fueled by his relationship with Han Solo, who seems to be a natural cynic. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, in the, uh, the radio drama, the Star Wars radio drama, I always remember that there was more expansion of Ben connecting with Chewbacca at the cantina and Luke mm. being a little put off. He's like, wow, a Wookiee. I've never seen one of those before. And, and Ben, you know, I, he almost seems like he doesn't believe that Chewbacca could be of any service to them. But but Ben says Wookiees have a great affinity to the Force in their own way. Oh. And I've always connected with that. And why Yoda then went to go work with the Wookiees during Revenge of the Sith. It's because there's just something about the Wookiees where the Force swirls around them, and they don't master it like Jedi or nothing. Good point. Of all places that Yoda could have been in those final days of the Clone Wars, 
Why Kashyyyk? We know that there were battles waging on all these fronts. Why Kashyyyk? And 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 of and of all people, Yoda, the most powerful uh, Jedi ever, uh, and and obviously one of the most esteemed in terms of generals. Yeah, why there? I I, I love that idea that maybe he, he it, because it is so centered in the Force, and the Wookiees do have such a, a unique connection that he needed that. He thought that would that would help. And look at where Yoda ended up after the Clone Wars on Dagobah. I don't think that was just random. He went there because of all the life on the planet. And as you know, you know, the force connects all life. And, and that was something that Yoda could sort of siphon off. And the Wookiees on Kashyyyk live in a, a similar sort of, I mean, not a swampy jungle right, kind but of thing. Teeming well, it with life. Jungle. They, the teeming but yes, with yes, life. Yes, it, yeah. it's yeah. it's all nature, and it's all their trees are ginormous. You could only imagine all the different you know, life right. forms that populate a single tree. I mean, that populate a single tree right outside my window here on planet Earth. You know? Yeah, and it's, those trees uh, are enormous. They're gargantuan. Yeah, you know, I always thought that when. Obi-Wan discovers that Camino has been removed, deleted from the charts, that that was what inspired Yoda to be able to hide Dagobah. I thought that that's where they were going, that Yoda's like, oh, okay, I'm going to just Good delete idea. this planet from, <laughs> from the charts. But I also knew that he was able to hide because of how much life there was right. on Dagobah and that, that hid his, his, his force connection. Was Dagobah off the charts? I kind of think it was. I, I think that maybe Yoda did do some finagling there in the old Jedi archives when uh, Jocasta knew was looking the other way. You know? He's, yeah, he <laughs> says, you know, Luke says to Yoda, he, or excuse me, to R2, he says, we're going to the Dagobah system. And he's like, pop, 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 pop. Uh, yeah, I got it. And then what does, what does Luke say? Does he say something like, it's, uh, I know, it, I we're not going with them. We're going to the Dagobah system. Um, yeah, and then he says something about autopilot. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but so R2 doesn't seem to make any sort of like, where's Dagobah? I don't know. And so I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Mm, I don't know that there's yeah, any evidence yeah. that it was deleted. But I just but remember being in the Why would R2 have to ask where they're going? Unless Luke punched in specific coordinates without R2's knowledge. Mm. The whole purpose of having an astromech aboard an X-Wing is so they can access the Navi computer and make those light speed calculations, which are very delicate to do. That's why you have an R2 unit aboard. So Luke might have punched in some coordinates that were unknown to old R2. Where the hell are we going? <laughs> what are you doing up there? Relax, we're going to the Dagobah system. Boop, beep, yeah. boop. <laughs> Bop. <laughs> Whistle, beep, boop. Isn't it fun that after, you know, almost 50 years, there's still these these things to talk about and yes, mysteries yes. to and unsolve. Somehow you and me always know how to... Uh, <laughs> How to find the gold in the mine. I, I, right. I just, what a great conversation. There's just things you don't think about. Like, I, I saw this um, post on social media. I, I have no idea where I saw it or who said it or if it's an RFR listener or not. But it was a guy saying, hey, listen, I love Star Wars. I'm 50-something years old. I, I eat it up. I, I watch it 500 times every year. I think I know everything about it. And now my son is loving Star Wars. And I'm like, this is great. This is perfect. I'm going to hold his hand and guide him along the way. And the first question he asked me is, do clone troopers shoot left-handed or right-handed? <laughs> And the dad's like, I thought I was prepared for any question this kid could throw at me. And he thought, next thing I know, I'm Googling are clone <laughs> troopers left handed or right handed. And I was like, yeah, you know, that's just the, the glory of the franchise in the story itself is that it seems like it's ever evolving. It's not a story that's ever locked down in any sort of time frame or segment of fan base or anything it's it's just like 
I certainly don't think about Star Wars the same way I did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's always evolving. And that's something that I think is really attractive about the story itself. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to close the loop on these lines from Empire Strikes Back because I know people are shouting them at us right now. So here it is, Luke into the comm link. He says, there's nothing wrong, R2, just setting a new course. We're not going to regroup with the others. We're going to the Dagobah system. Yes, R2. That's all right. I'd like to keep it on manual control for a while. He wasn't letting R2 near nothing. Right. Exactly. R2's R2's first beep. Hey, how come I can't access the Nava computer anymore? That's all right. I just punched in some Gordon. Well, how come I can't fly this thing no more? I'm going (laughs) to, it's on manual control now. Just take a nap, droid. You know, (laughs) in 30 years, I'm going to cover you with a tarp anyway and split. Uh, one last thing about this book, Star Wars Archives, at the very end, George talks in pretty good detail about his plans for what he intended for episode seven, eight, and nine. Very different story. And no, it's not some sort of weird molecular level tale of midichlorians. It's it's not that at all. So I think maybe on an upcoming show, we'll we'll look into those some of those interviews that are in there and uh, and break it down because it's it's pretty interesting. Paul Duncan, awesome job, awesome service to give us those late interviews with uh, with with George. Uh, before we go into news, let's talk about what's going on right now in the world of RFR on Patreon. Wow, it's been a busy busy week this week, and and I love it. You know, I can't get enough of RFR on Patreon, hanging out there all the time, chatting with all the uh, RFR supporters and VIPs and every week it's guaranteed you're going to get some uh, podcasts that you can't find anywhere else if you have access to RFR on Patreon. Also, you get a little peek at some RFR listeners collections, Star Wars collections. We do the RFR Collector Spotlight. Just a few days ago, we uh, featured Jeremy and uh, his collection. He moved from LA to Texas and uh, set up a whole new scene over there with his Star Wars collection. RFR RPG is back this week with our 12th adventure. The adventures of Podcastus and Grando the Grand continue. We are uh, dealing with the Beast Riders of Onderon and visiting the moon of Dixon to take part in a traditional Onderon hunt. You don't want to miss this one. Grando goes up the tree. (laughs) <laughs> oh, it's hilarious, and it's it's exciting, and uh, Game Master Matt Rashid does an incredible job of running our RPG gaming sessions, and uh, you can see the full show video of that if you have RFR All Access. Also, what else? The Babu Freaks. The Babu Freaks are back. We're talking about the Star Wars Holiday Special and the documentary A Disturbance in the Force. We are talking about uh, Star Wars collecting. Uh, There's so much going on with the Babu Freaks at all times. Such rapid fire. A a lot of times when we're done with those recording sessions, I I just sort of sit back in my chair and go, what the heck just hit me there with that conversation? (laughs) Because you never know what the Babu Freaks are going to talk about. We're Chicago area Star Wars fans who met each other through this podcast, Rebel Force Radio, and uh, we become fast friends in the process and uh, we always have a good time when we hang out so uh, yeah new episode of the Babu Freaks new episode of RFR RPG RFR Q&A will be back again next week and uh, that show is hitting uh, gosh three times a month at least so so much going on with RFR on Patreon bonus podcast ad free episodes of Rebel Force Radio along with full show video you don't want to miss out. Be there for the fun. Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. See you there. I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer, I have good news. All right, we got news here. Um, Jim, this is something I hadn't heard. So some updates, perhaps, got a website out there this is an industry site productionlist.com they're making the claim that the daisy ridley ray film is going in front of cameras as early as april 7th but that's being contradicted in other outlets apparently 
Yes, indeed it is. But let's first look at what ProductionList.com has put on their um, their form here con- concerning the untitled Star Wars project to be directed by uh, Obeyed Shinoi. Feature film in development pre-production, last updated December 4th, 2023. Shoot date, April 7th, 2024 in the UK is what this form is is reporting it offers a project summary the sequel follows the events of rise of skywalker and will focus on ray as she builds a new jedi order we've heard all that before but as i scroll down i'm noticing cast and crew charmino bade chinoy director yes fact kathleen kennedy producer yes fact justin Britt gibson writer damon lindelof writer hey, wait whoa <laughs> <laughs> back it up. What did George Costanza say? Whoa, whoa, back it up. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> no, those guys are not attached to the project, nor have they been for a year. So uh, I don't know if we can really assume what is on this FTIA website, productionlist.com, as being absolute fact when it it contains those inconsistencies. That's the first thing that jumped out to me as I was looking at uh, at this thing. Is like, wow, you know, people are reporting this as if it's fact, but I don't, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem to be consistently. <laughs> well, I just assumed with something like ProductionList.com, I thought, oh, this is some sort of industry uh, website that uh, people that work on. Films and and whatnot uh, go to it's some sort of resource for them so that the information would be, I would assume, accurate. Uh, but this this may not this might be like IMDb. It's run by the agents. It's run by some of the the, the talent mm-hmm. that's out there. They keep their pages. They pay to get the pages up. Uh, so maybe it's not necessarily an independent news source. Right. So some reporters reached out and they received news from Lucasfilm that. Uh, That is not a date set in stone in any way, shape, or form. The script is still being written at this time. It'd be hard to go in front of cameras. They've been working on this script for at least two years at this point. So it better be damn good Mm. when they get to the the final uh, script. But uh, still, you know, I mean, you can have a great script and still have a crummy film. And uh, I'm just happy they're taking their time with it as opposed to announcing these premature release dates. Right. I mean, Lucasfilm is being much more protective over this kind of information now. And they're not even humoring the idea of a shooting schedule, much less than a release date. For this particular film, we heard 2026. I still believe they'll be able to hit that if they shoot next year. But I think smart money is on this film shooting over the summertime in the UK. If they can ever agree on a script for it, that (laughs) is. And with the strikes, this is, I think, a lot of the release schedules that were released prior to this. uh, It's all up in the air now. I don't think we can take any of that. Pre-strike, yeah. Uh, those is announcements, yeah, yeah, it is because we were supposed to get two Star Wars movies in 2026. I have tickets for Rogue Squadron, which opens in two weeks. Yeah, so well, I'm I, really hoping <laughs> they get. We're their doing stuff a together, whole right? big show in Cleveland. Uh, <laughs> it's it's gonna be great. It's gonna be me and Jason and. You know, maybe a, a cockroach or two <laughs> talking about Rogue Squadron. So, I mean, that's why I keep bringing up Rogue Squadron. It's just an example of saying, hey, listen, you know, we, we can't be jumping to conclusions about anything until we see that trailer with the release date at the end of the trailer. Right. I mean, I'm really feeling that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, a lot of schedules, uh, not just Star Wars, studios across the board are revamping everything. Everything. But there is hope. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, according to entertainment reporter Jeff Snyder. On his show, The Hot Take, he revealed uh, we may be hearing some Ray news sooner than later. I wouldn't be surprised if we heard Star Wars news this month. 
Star Wars has always been a franchise that's like things don't don't always get announced. You know, so I do think that there are things that are lying in wait. Yeah. Possibly casting news that's already done. Like I, I think that that Daisy Ridley movie probably has its lead already. And it's just a matter of a report. Yeah, her right name's now. Daisy Ridley. <laughs> Who's well, going to be in you, that Daisy Ridley movie? <laughs> well, see, that's that's the interesting thing. Is the film going to be so Ray centric like we think? They're calling it the Ray be, film. Is she going to be serving a role similar to what Mark Hamill served in the Last Jedi? Oh my God! Think about that for a second. You know what they say about paybacks? <laughs> <laughs> well, the word is she is trying to establish the Jedi Order, and it comes under threat. Right. So I assume she will be one of a few leads in this film. Yeah, Wouldn't be surprised likely. to see John Boyega return. And then maybe with someone else. Then you have your new big three. Sorry, mm. Oscar. Well, but, he's gone uh, on. He's, he's a pretty in-demand guy, so I don't think he's too, too, too upset about it. But it would be great no. to see all three of them, honestly. If we're going to do it, why not have all three of them? But I, yeah, his name has not been tossed yeah. out there. He, yeah, and he's involved at the Dune franchise now. And oh, um, right, you know uh, that could actually turn off producers from yeah. like even Star Wars. Let's bring Oscar Isaac back. Hey, he's so Dune now. He's so <laughs> he's so Moon Knight now. <laughs> Moon Knight. I don't. Wanna, yeah, there's been no wanna... talk of a Moon Knight season two, as far as I know. I don't think. That's... No, that didn't go over too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, some fans enjoyed it, whatever. Uh, more right. power to Who's them. Who's to say? I mean, super fans are a different breed. So when we talk in broad terms about things being a success or a mm. failure or whatever, it really doesn't matter to the super fan who is committed and loyal and there for the long haul. Dude, I'm still waiting for Popeye 2, okay? I'm <laughs> such a fan... I know we lost Robin Williams. I'm all about recasting. I know they're going to have to do it. But no, it my point is it never it never mattered to me. If I love a movie, uh, you know, there's there's so much forgiveness that you have, especially on things that you loved as a child and you know that there are problems with it, but you loved it and it does it just doesn't matter. But then there are some more empirical ways to determine what is a success, what is a flop. It doesn't mean that we're, that there's not value in it or that you as right. a fan shouldn't or can't appreciate it. But when we're talking about movies and the industry and all of that, which is part of this discussion in Star Wars, not my favorite part, but it's part of the discussion, it has to be, then we're going to have those metrics and they're going mm -hmm. to be, you know, enter the conversation. But no, I don't necessarily... Uh, look back on my favorite films and uh, judge them by how much they made at the box office. No one cares. No one knows. No, no one remembers. And I mean, as we're rolling into the holiday season, all you have to do is look at the film It's a Wonderful Life, a so-called box office flop. Oh, yes. When it was originally released, and it has gone on to legendary status that right. makes a ton of money every Christmas. <laughs> Yes. You know, Puppet Lando's on to something. We got to get in on that holiday cash. <laughs> you know, He looks at Mariah Carey and says, every year she's cashing in. Why aren't we? I'm, Why aren't I'm down we? with that, that felt thought. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I see what he's thinking. But um, so, so yeah, uh, we'll keep our ears open. We might be hearing some uh, big news coming from Star Wars. Also, I think Jeff Snyder sort of infers that there are unannounced things that mm. are deep in the work right now that could come across our desks as Star right. Wars fans in the next few weeks. So, yeah, we'll be keeping our ears wide open. Remember, in, at the end of 2020, gosh, it was it was late, uh, mid-December, right before the holidays when they had that big investors call and... Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of infamous now because so many titles they announced never came to light. Rangers of the New Republic, the droid story. What Hello? happened to the droid story? What happened to droid story? You would think of all the ones that they have the most control over. We were, I, I think that was going to be some sort of CG animated thing. 
Um, you know, Anthony Daniels is there. He's going to be doing his, his 3PO thing, I'm sure. So why couldn't they have made that happen? That seemed like a slam dunk, easy to do. You don't have to worry about actors. Oh, hmm. Gosh, I you know, and there hasn't been a peep about that thing since the announcement. No. Which is really no. puzzling to me. Yet Willow flourished with a full season. Right. Which you can't watch anymore now because no. Disney Plus stripped it off its service. Did you know that? I that do know that. I do know that. I, I think what they're going to probably end up doing, you know, that there is a convergence between Disney Plus and Hulu. So for you that are out there like me yeah. who get your, your cable through Hulu, Hulu is my essentially my cable provider, my live TV provider. There's going to be some big changes. What I've heard is that the first phase is that uh, a, the most significant Hulu content is going to be going over to Disney Plus. And rolling out this week, as a matter of fact, you boot up your Disney Plus app, you'll start to see a Hulu menu right in there. And you'll be able to go in and check out some of that Hulu content. Um, so you'll have one fee, one monthly fee. It'll cover both apps. But the Hulu app is going to be really stripped down, primarily for those people who have uh, their sort of their get their cable, their live TV through that service. Oh my and God. a few shows that Disney doesn't, you know, these corporations have done a, such a great job of job of chopping up all this entertainment. So there's going to be a few shows like Modern Family and some things that aren't going to make it over to uh, to Disney Plus. So you're going to still have to straddle both apps, but make sure that you're signed in with the same email address if you subscribe to both. There's your little PSA for you Hulu subscribers. Modern Family. Why? Why did you specifically cite Modern Family? Is that on the Jason and Deborah Knightley? No, no. I, well, I love I love the series, but no, it was actually just listed as one of those shows. Oh, see, it I won't see. make the 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 switch over to uh, to to Disney Plus for whatever reason. I don't know. Phil Dunphy was a great character, and yes, I'm not going to go on too much about him. <laughs> but I always remember one scene when his cell phone was ringing, and he looked at the person he was in the room with, and he goes. What instrument does Yo-Yo Ma play again? <laughs> Cello. <laughs> <laughs> he holds the phone up. And, oh, and the I've gone on all this jokes, time. You know, I am, the, yeah, that's a dad joke. <laughs> yeah. That's expert level dad joke. That's like, <laughs> that's that's king of the hill dad joke. So, All right. Well, what, what do we know about Taika Waititi? Is he he's still out there yapping and talking about his <laughs> Star Wars movie? We've heard him be a little bit sort of uh, like almost flippant yeah, about being involved in Star Wars, saying that you know, people are going to hate what he does, and, you know, whatever. He makes, he jokes a lot of times. Yes. He's a He's joke. a comedian. Yeah. But he's on with Kelly, and Kelly, you know, she's like America's girl next door, daughter, whatever. I, everyone yeah. loves Kelly Clarkson. You, yeah, she's great. And so I think just being on her show brings him a little bit more down to earth where he, he kind of st strips away a little bit of his pretense and actually shows some legitimate love and care for the star Wars franchise. Mm. So he gives us an update on the film, the script he's been working on allegedly <laughs> uh, to Kelly Clarkson. And, and like I said, I think there's a little more sincerity in what he divulges to her than what we've heard from him in the past. So I heard that maybe you're doing Star Wars. Are you going to do a Star Wars film? Yeah, I've been developing that for a few years. Okay. Uh, with them. But I think, you know, and with any film, but that one in particular, it's something I'd really like to get right, so I don't want to rush it. So um, Yeah. Just gonna but that's just exciting. Just bubble along on the side. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. Our family, we were Star Wars fans growing yeah, up. Yeah, me so, too. Yeah. Me too. I want to cool. capture that, you know, that joy and the entertainment of those early ones. That, yeah. Uh, like Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi and all yeah. those ones. So, um, yeah, OG. I'm trying to figure that out. And, uh, All right, take your time. It'll happen. Okay. All right. It will happen, he says. He's With confidence, it will happen. But I like what he's saying. I, you know, he wants to take his time. I do believe this is something that is pushed off to the side for, mm -hmm. for him right now. But there's nothing he can do about it because Kathy Kennedy announced in that 2020 investors call that he was working on something. And that was three years ago. So now every talk show he goes on, no matter what yeah. he's promoting, the topic is going to eventually move to Star Wars. 
Yeah. And you're absolutely yeah, so, right. I loved his demeanor there with Kelly Clarkson. He was a much little, more- A little bit, yeah. of, it's refreshing, refreshing yes. compared to right. what we've heard from him in the past. Yeah. I believe. On the red carpets and all of that. Yeah. Where he is very flippant. Yeah. But he, he's a little more sincere with her because she is Kelly Clarkson. And, um, you know, she brings out the best in people, I think. Yeah. How do you not you love know, Kelly There's Clarkson. a wholesomeness about Kelly- Right. And I think people respond to that. I just like what he's saying. It's a total departure from what he said in the past about how people are going to, a lot of people are going to hate it because it right. comes from him. And I'm going to piss stuff. people off. Right. He seems like he's really trying to nail the authenticity that fueled the original trilogy and brought out certain feelings from him as a youth when he was watching those films. But he's not just plowing through it phoning it in he, he's or, or having to meet some it. arbitrary deadline that's been set by a ceo in the ivory tower so that's what's going on with taika i still think he'll get his film done before ryan johnson gets his trilogy done, so. <laughs> i think that's a safe bet that's yeah. a safe bet all right so um i i didn't get or see whether or not Disney plus us released a similar press release, but Disney plus in the UK uh, sent out, why would we get a press release? We're only the number one star Wars podcast in the world. Uh, But we did get a copy of this Disney plus uh, UK press release that details what's going to happen on the streaming network in 2024. Interestingly enough, the headline of the of the uh, press release, Disney Plus, just getting started nonstop, new exclusives coming in 2024, FX's Shogun, UK original series Renegade, Nell, and Rivals, Star Wars The Acolyte, Marvel Studios' Agatha Darkhold Diaries, and more. Star Wars Acolyte, I thought interesting getting in the subhead of this yeah. press release, not Skeleton Crew, which seems to be uh, the one that's just right there at the gate, ready to come out. So Subhead is giving Star Wars the Acolyte the nod. Um, But Jim, nowhere in the press release is anything about Andor Season Mm 2. As a matter of fact, there's nothing in this press release for that matter about the final season of The Bad Batch. So that, I I bring that up because just because Andor Season 2 is not in this release doesn't necessarily mean that it's not on the docket for 2024. As Tony Gilroy said, he was hoping for August. However, despite that, the folks over at Gizmodo, they have a source and Gizmodo is a pretty reputable outlet. They have a source that is telling them that uh, the Acolyte and Skeleton crew are scheduled to come out in 2024 along with some animated shows like the final season of the bad batch and or season two is not expected to join the lineup. The reasons are that the show was forced into a mid production delay uh, as well as the release of a uh, due to the writer's strike um, as well as the release of the other two shows, which will take up a good chunk of the year. The source didn't 100% close the book on and or season two in 2024 but made it seem highly unlikely. So I, I would I would imagine that the strikes would have impacted all of the shows that seem to be in parallel stages of production in a similar way, but maybe there's something going on with Andor, um, could be schedules of the actors, who knows, Uh, That is going to push that into 2025. I would guess that if it does get pushed into 2025, it'll be early 2025, like uh, a January, you know, first of the year type thing. Yeah. Um, So what do you think? Do you think that this is uh, pretty accurate? Well, those strikes went on, you know, the actor strike went on for like four months, writer's strike, maybe even a little longer, five months or whatever. So you have to imagine that's, the sort of delay you're dealing with mm-hmm. and uh it's it's wise to push it back i think if you have to push and or back push it back you know i i, lo- I love the flexibility here gone are the days when bob Iger was holding george lucas by the neck making him <laughs> sign the paper and then immediately announcing the release dates for the next three star wars films 
You know, I, there's a little more common sense. It, Bob didn't hold George by the neck. It's a big neck to grab, too. You know? <laughs> right. He's got the <laughs> waddle just, there. You can't just, you know. <laughs> the goiter. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 I, yeah, you're but, speaking, but what I'm saying yeah. is at least they're they're taking their time. They're They're trying to make sure the quality is there before a release date gets announced. As opposed to holding the gun to these creatives' heads. I mean, there was a whole book that was just released about how all of these Marvel guys have been just worked to death. Mm -hmm. And it explains why some of the special effects you've been seeing, some of the scripts that have been made into films, why they're all just so half-baked is because it's, it's this whole quantity over quality. Well, I think now... Like the balance of the force, the balance of uh, Hollywood filmmaking is starting to tip again back towards quality over quantity. I sure hope so. I, I sure celebrate hope so. that. I'm what happy surprised about that. me. What surprised me the most was that one acolyte took the it sort of stepped out in front with the way that the press release was written. I noticed that myself. Yes, uh, and I just didn't think that acolyte was necessarily any further along. Than than Andor season two, I we knew that Skeleton Crew had a jump on the other shows, so that wasn't a surprise. But I just didn't know that the Acolyte was was ready to ready to drop essentially. Well, see, I think I yeah, I think that's really far along in its uh, post production, um, and I think Skeleton Crew is primarily locked in the can right yeah. now, ready to go at any time because I think they were targeting fall slash winter 2023 mm-hmm. but um they could be reevaluating their release schedule and their you know after the ahsoka thing left it was left open-ended the way it was maybe smart minds are thinking hey let's just throw in something totally fresh right now and Oh, interesting. You know, kind it's of not reset. so bogged down in the lore as the, you know yeah, one of the criticisms yeah. of Ahsoka was that it was so the cost of entry was high. So maybe they're looking for that. Maybe they're looking for a fresh starting place in 2024 with Acolyte, which will be totally fresh. And I'm kind of I'm really looking forward to that. Actually, I I, I fear that. A lot of my critiques of the Ahsoka series was because, you know, I was so painted in the corner by all the lore and I was demanding more answers than it. Well, and also I think the whole script was half baked for the entire season, but that's just, you know, that's, that's my opinion. Um, with Acolyte, you get a fresh start, something totally new. We don't have any assumptions going into this thing. And everyone is on the ground floor for it. Yeah, sure. I guess people who read the High Republic books might have an upper hand on certain knowledge about the mechanics of the the way things work, you know, in the background. But for the characters, which is what I care about, I, I want the characters to go on a story. And I don't care about who or when Starlight Base blew up or whatever. I, I don't care about any of that stuff. Because, I mean, obviously my knowledge of High Republic is only uh, the first phase primarily, and it was so confusing to me, I didn't retain a lot of it. So I'm looking forward to a fresh start with Acolyte, and I think a lot of fans are going to get that fresh start all together. So it'll be more of a a communal universal experience, you know, where we yeah, can right. enjoy it we're, all together. For the most part, we're all on the same page. Uh, yes. Th- the 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 release does give us a description here. Some of this is some of the the language is similar, but a little bit new here. Star Wars: The Acolyte is a mystery thriller that will take viewers into a galaxy of shadowy secrets and emerging dark side powers in the final days of the High Republic era. A former Padawan reunites with her Jedi Master to investigate a series of crimes, but the forces they confront are more sinister than they ever anticipated. A former Padawan. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. A former Padawan. Reuniting with the Jedi Master. So we have a falling out. Now, we just saw this in Ahsoka. We just yeah, saw is a it falling, a falling out. out. Or is well, it just a natural, you know, I mean, we've seen Masters. Former Padawan reunites, yeah, with her Jedi Master. How does the apprentice elevate himself into Master? 
How does that happen? Because in Star Wars, we've only seen Padawans being separated from their master via death, as far as I can tell. Or abandonment. Like in Obi-Wan, right? Well, um, what about Ahsoka and, and, and Anakin? That was an abandoned. Well, she, she abandoned. Walked she away. left. She walked she away. Walked right? away. Yeah. So yeah. We, we never got to see her like graduate to. So how long do you serve as a Padawan for the master? Is it until the master dies or does the Padawan or they have some sort of acrimonious split? <laughs> well, you know, or, Qui- or excuse me, uh, Yoda refers to Dooku as his old Padawan. Yeah, but Dooku so, left the order to join the Sith. Yeah. So, I mean, he split. Was yeah. Dooku Yoda's Padawan all the way up until the time he turned his back on the Jedi Order? Well, I think it's sort of like teacher or professor, no matter how old you are. You know, that was always your teacher. That was always your mentor. Your Right. Uh, almost like an honorary title, a uh, title of respect. Can you become a Jedi Knight without being a Padawan? I wouldn't think so. I think you'd have to, you know, it's like, can you be an Eagle Scout without being a Weeblos? So, but does that commit you then to a lifetime of uh, being teamed up with the Master? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you're dependent on the fate of the master in order to go your... If a master assumes a young Jedi Knight to be his Padawan, Mm -hmm. or a young Jedi apprentice to be his Padawan, does that commit the two of them to a lifetime as a duo, like Batman and Robin? Or does the Padawan Mm. eventually graduate? Or does the Padawan only graduate when the master passes, much like the Sith do with the rule of two? Oh, I have never thought about this. I've never thought about this. Um, Nor have I until this very moment. <laughs> right. And I have questions. Because you're right. We've not seen a, a, a graduation, so to speak, right. I mean, outside of a death or an abandonment or uh, some sort of circumstance like that. We've not seen it done the, the proper way or the... So yeah. the way a Jedi becomes a master is by training a Padawan. So the moment when they have to Jedi, pass the trials, right? There's the trial. Well, well, they have to pass the trials. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if they pass the trials, does that mean then they split? And what well, is then they the become trial? a master, and then they become a knight, a Jedi knight, and then no, they become a master when they yes. take on an apprentice. Right when they take on an apprentice. Right then they were a master. When they're assigned so, an apprentice. So can a Padawan also be a master? It's Count Dooku specifically. Mm-hmm. He served as Yoda's Padawan. Mm-hmm. He also served as Qui-Gon's master. Right. But did that eliminate Dooku from being Yoda's Padawan when he became Qui-Gon's master? Hey, once he... a Padawan, always a Padawan. No, because because they have to be a duo. They have to be together. Oh, so there is there 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 comes a point when there's a graduation. Yes, and there would have to they, be a split. There would have they to be snip a... off the braid. Mm-hmm. But see where it gets confusing is the fact that Obi Wan and Anakin continued to serve together during the Clone Wars, and at that point, Anakin had become a Jedi Knight. Right but he still served with Obi-Wan. Shouldn't Anakin have gone off somewhere? Well, no, Anakin had an apprentice, Ahsoka. Right, right. He had yes. a Padawan. Right. And he still referred to Obi-Wan as master. But, but they refer referred to each to other. Yo, but Yoda is master. They, they, he referred they refer to, to each other as master. Right. It's like chefs in the kitchen. They all right. call each other chef. <laughs> <laughs> but Anakin... Was still, yeah. It's it, it's it's hard. Jim, to I'm decipher. having the same reaction to this question as two trains leave two cities at the same time and they're heading towards each other. What time do they get there? Um, it's that's that's a that's a brain twister. And well, I know people it, out there you know, are thinking they have the answer, but no, 
I don't think anyone does. I think you really have to think about this and then realize that you don't have the answer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Rebel Force Radio. Rebel Force Radio. Rebel Force Radio. May the Force be with you at Christmas and forever. Masters who have Padawans, who are masters who have Padawans, but they're still Padawans. What do you think? Let us know. Leave us a voicemail. <laughs> We'd love to hear your take on it. Because uh, once you start digging beneath the surface, you realize that it seems a little more convoluted <laughs> than the yeah. clean cut line of progression that we thought existed. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Give us sure. a call, 708-3201-RFR, and let us know what you think about this very topic. All right. Uh, and just to button this up, so the official uh, description of Skeleton Crew is as follows, according to this latest press release from Disney. Star Wars Skeleton Crew follows the journey of four kids who make a mysterious discovery on their seemingly safe home planet then get lost in a strange and dangerous galaxy. Finding their way home and meeting unlikely allies and enemies will be a greater adventure than they ever imagined. Seemingly safe home planet, that jumped out at me. Mm. Get lost in a strange and dangerous galaxy. Could it be mm. the uh, Paradia galaxy that we were introduced in Ahsoka? Perhaps. And then finding their way home and meeting unlikely allies and enemies and uh, Jude Law, who is uh, the lead in the series along with the kids. He's playing and Jedi. Urkel. <laughs> Urkel. Urkel. Is there an Urkel? in the show. Yeah, Urkel <laughs> oh, Urkel is in the right, show. Right, of course. Yes. Urkel the is actor. in the show. The actor. Jaleel, Jaleel White. White. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, okay. Well, uh, uh the thing that makes me think that there's still hope for Andor maybe coming in at the very end of 2024 is that this press release does not mention the Bad Batch. And I think we're pretty much certain to see Bad Batch in 2024. Yeah, for sure. They just wrapped up the final sound mixes on it. And that's usually before uh, they add the soundtrack, that's the final thing they do. Or that final mix could have included soundtrack. So mm. it's it's very close to uh, being uh, released. And, and if so, you know, if it's just going to be Acolyte, Skeleton Crew, Bad Batch in 2024, that matches the amount of streaming content we got in 2023. And right. I felt like it was a very busy year. So, yeah. <laughs> so strap no. in. But, I mean, the, the question is, what are we going to get next? Acolyte or Skeleton Crew? I oh, yeah. thought it was a done deal. We would be getting Skeleton Crew first, but I'm not so sure right now. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't think anyone knows, uh, at least not outside of the uh, ivory tower of Disney. Uh, Ariana Greenblatt, a huge, uh, she made a huge impression on Star Wars fans. In the With the little screen time that she had in Ahsoka, she really became, I think, inarguably... Uh, sort of, I think a lot of fans ideal Ahsoka uh, in, in, in live action form. She was much closer to that Ashley Eckstein version that we grew to love in the animated series. Um, she's now able to talk about her work. And I yeah. guess she was at a Power of Women event for Variety. Yeah, and she appeared as a presenter. And so she was on the red carpet and the media talked to her and uh, Variety was there with their cameras and microphones and uh, I don't care where Ariana is or what she's doing. I just want to hear more from her. I'm I'm quite smitten with this young talent and uh, I think she's got a bright future ahead of her and uh, we can say, hey, we were here on the ground floor when she was just <laughs> young Ahsoka by the time she's stepping up to receive her first of many Academy Awards. All right, maybe I'm putting too much pressure on the kid. I should back <laughs> off a little bit and just listen to what she had to say about how she trained for her appearance as young Ahsoka. It was amazing. I got to train for, I think, around two months. I was actually training during filming Barbie, but I obviously couldn't tell anyone. 
Um, it was really incredible, and to just like fully endorse myself into that space, and everyone that works on Star Wars is like the biggest Star Wars fan, which like makes the environment that much better. Um, but yeah, the stunt training was crazy, super hard. But Rosario Dawson was like my mentor through it all, so shout out her. <laughs> you know something um, that she said. Uh, yeah, great. She sounds like she was surrounded by a lot of support, loved being in Star Wars. But but something she sure. said. Uh, reminded me of, of of some of the feedback that we've gotten we've gotten Jim over the last couple of months where we talked about what what is Disney's aversion to having real Star Wars fans at the helm of some of this stuff and of course we get a lot of feedback uh, from you all out there listening saying well what are you talking about we hear from these creatives all the time and they all love Star Wars they're all Star Wars fans. And I wanted to address that a little bit because I feel as though there's a difference between, Liking Star Wars, having been exposed to Star Wars, having a, a a mom or a dad that loves Star Wars. There's a difference between that type of fan and being a real fan that understands the lore and the mythology. And I'm going to use Dave Filoni or even a guy like Kyle or, 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 or FJ and our own RFR family as being examples of that. We're not saying that Star Wars isn't being made by people who like the property, but there's a difference between that and being a real bona fide fan that understands the universe, understands the visual language, understands the uh, the, the tone, the, the the thing that makes Star Wars different and unique. I hear you loud and clear, and also understand who we're hearing that from. It's Ariana, and, and something tells me. She probably didn't know Jack about Star Wars heading into this production. She's a 16-year-old kid. Maybe. I don't know. I'm sure she was at Force Awakens. Everyone went to see that. <laughs> right. But I think I think her knowledge of Star Wars going into the production was extremely limited. So anybody she comes into contact with who knows what a lightsaber is is a super huge super fan, you know? Right. But what what you said, Jason, there's there's a difference between being a fan and beat someone who really understands Star Wars. Somebody who Ariana Greenblatt might be labeling super knowledgeable about Star Wars and everything, well, they might just know about it from a production standpoint. Did they read all the Dark Horse comics in the <laughs> 90s? Were they reading the Marvels in the 70s and 80s? Were they, you know, are they listening to Star Wars podcasts each and every week? Do they have a room or an entire floor of their home dedicated to their Star Wars collection? Have they seen Star Wars 500 times? <laughs> no, no. What her, it's all about perspective. And uh, the people she's talking about don't ha hold a candle to you, me, or anyone else listening to this show or any Star Wars podcast for that matter. I mean, if you're if you're searching it out, you have a, pro, a more profound connection to the story than just your rando on the street who bought a ticket to see the uh, Rise of Skywalker, you know. I mean, yeah. That's my take. Yeah. No. Uh agreed. I just had to get that. I had to get that off my chest because we have received a lot of that feedback saying, "What are you talking about? The, all these people are fans." Yeah, I it's know. Like, I well, know. there's a lot of people that that uh decided to go into show business because they loved Star Wars, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have the same kind of knowledge as as, as I say as a guy like Dave Filoni or or, yeah. or, or, or Kyle, you know. And Dave matter. Dave's so knowledgeable about it, he's been able to ascend the ranks at Lucasfilm to become this top corporate executive there. Right. This is a guy who who was working on King of the Hill back in the day, you know, <laughs> scribbling right. down drawings and of Hank and Bobby. Avatar you Last know? Airbender. Yeah. You know, so and now all of a sudden he's this top corporate executive at Lucasfilm. It's because he knows his stuff. And everyone at Lucasfilm defers to Dave Filoni. But you know who could take Dave Filoni head on head in a conversation about Star Wars and get deep about it? Me, Swank, and everyone listening to this podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that we are the the knowledgeable fans. We are the super fans. It's all a matter of perspective. Yeah. So yeah. Good on All her. right. Uh, boy, we haven't heard from Adam Driver in a while. Adam Driver actually talking a, a, a little Star Wars these days? 
Well, you know, he's he's uh, in that Ferrari film, and so I think he's been doing pub for that. I saw mm. a great clip where he was doing a and a in a theater, and, and somebody went up to the mic and said that the uh, the crash effects in Ferrari were uh, cheesy looking, <laughs> and Driver goes, he goes, F you, what do you want from me? But he didn't say <laughs> F. <He> said, <laughs> really? Yeah, and it just took a swig out of his water, like no problem, you know. <laughs> oh, it was great. It was great. But what do I uh, look like? A special effects guy? Jesus, I didn't do that. Yeah, it just he, <laughs> he's not going to suffer any fools. <laughs> Adam Driver, I do like Adam Driver a lot, and um, he appeared on uh, the Chris Wallace show. Who's talking to Chris Wallace? And uh, Wallace. Uh, Asks him about appearing in Star Wars, and it leads into some thoughts that were kind of running through Adam's head when he killed Han Solo. Oh, yeah, I took it really seriously and and thought about it a lot, and was very on the fence. And um, about, I, I was aware that it was a great opportunity, and I didn't I didn't want to be in it and be bad. You know, like a, a, a lot of people were going to watch it. I was a fan of those movies. In the first of the movies, The Force Awakens, you confront uh, Han Solo, Mm -hmm. the the great heroic hero who also happens in the twisted story of Star Wars to be your father. I know it's a movie. I know you're playing a part. But you killed Harrison Ford. (laughs) I know. Yeah, somebody reminds me about that every day. Are you serious? <laughs> Not every day, but but yeah, well, yeah. It used to be more, but now it's probably once a month. Someone will let me know. Okay, that well, this, this is it for, for, this, <laughs> for this month. Was that on some silly level? Was that tough? The idea I'm going to off Harrison Ford. I remember shooting that day, and and it didn't feel like that at all. Obviously, John, John Williams wasn't playing in the background, right? Uh, and it was very uh, emotional, actually. The shooting it with Harrison. Harrison was so generous and contemplative and uh it, to me that was a a a, a great uh, a moment on set actually I'm, even though it was his his death <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh well i i'm i'm glad to see that the weight of the moment on set was was felt that's for sure you know you wouldn't want it to be just sort of this you know, r- random day of shooting. Everybody was aware of what they were doing. And, you know, Jim, it's been years that we've heard from Billy D. Williams talking about there wasn't a day that goes by that he doesn't hear about him being the guy that betrayed Han Solo. Now you got Adam Driver out there as the man who killed Han Solo. That's right. So <laughs> Billy D. used to drop his kids off to school and their fellow students would surround the car and start pointing the finger at Billy D. You betrayed Han Solo. And so the last thing you want to do if you're an actor is anything on screen that disses Han or or, or causes him <laughs> harm or anything, because you're going to live with that for the rest of your life, just like Adam Driver does. Now, he said he heard about it every day. Now he says it's down to every you know, once a month. Maybe. Mm, right. So it's cooled off. I don't know. If you run into Adam Driver on the sidewalk, just be like, Hey, has anybody said anything to you this month about you killing Han Solo? He'll be like, "No." Well, can I be the guy? You know, can I be your once a month? I'll meet you here once a month, every month, just to remind you that you killed Han Solo. Okay, you know, a few. That's what he would say. <laughs> but uh yeah you know i mean he obviously got a lot out of that and uh there was a little intimidation factor where he thought about maybe not taking the role but he couldn't resist the fact that it was going to be a massive boost to his career and adam driver you know i i think it speaks volumes about his talent does he get typecast he was able to you know roll on in his career is thriving just like Harrison Ford's did after Star Wars. His his co-star is not so lucky. Daisy yeah. Ridley, maybe not so lucky. Right. Uh, John Boyega, maybe not so lucky. Adam Driver hit the jackpot, just like Harrison Ford did. Speaking of Harrison Ford, I was yes. reminded this week on The Babu Freaks by uh, Babu Barry, um, Barry Harmon. He reminded me, hey, there's a great, 
Harrison Ford documentary on Disney Plus that dropped with Dial of Destiny, which is now available for streaming on on the platform. And uh, so I was like, wow, that's great. I got to check it out. Now, it's called Timeless Heroes, Indiana Jones and Harrison Ford. Well, they finally do a documentary about me and Indiana <laughs> Jones gets billing ahead of me. <laughs> but so um, it's, it's a great documentary, obviously leaning heavily on Indiana Jones stuff. But it does cover Harrison's career for the most part. Uh, his early life, his introduction into big time filmmaking with... American Graffiti, which led into Star Wars, which led into Indiana Jones, and the rest is history. And so the documentary really focuses on the Indiana Jones stuff, Um, not so much Star Wars, but if you're going to tell the story about how Harrison Ford became Indiana Jones, you have to talk about his experience in Star Wars playing the character Han Solo. So uh, I grabbed a few audio clips uh, a little quick hits here from the documentary, which I do recommend. I, I think it's I haven't so watched well this yet. That's also on the list for this week. Yeah, yeah, put that yeah. on the list. You, you must watch it. The first clip uh, I have from the uh, Timeless Heroes documentary is George Lucas himself, and he talks about casting Han Solo. I was actually uh, doing the casting on Star Wars. We went through quite a few actors. We went through a lot of possibilities. Tell me, what was it about Harrison that initially drew you to him as an actor? Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Later, I found out it was the casting director that said, here, sit out right out in front of the office and pretend like you're building something. Oh, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> we had tests with him and Carrie and Mark, and we went through the whole thing, and that was where the best chemistry was. You know, he fit the part. Fit the part. <laughs> and uh, we, we know from the screen tests that have been famously released now over the years that uh, there was chemistry between them. And you you could see it even in those earliest moments. And you had Harrison, who was really just a guy that was filling in when there wasn't somebody else to read for Han Solo, which is in, in, incredible. Yeah, he was doing the lines with the actors who were auditioning for Star Wars. And uh, I find it interesting. You know what I've always wondered about that, though? Did Harrison exclusively read lines as Han Solo? Or are there is there footage of him reading the Luke Skywalker dialogue for actors who might have been huh. auditioning for Han? Right. Because other actors auditioned for Han, Kurt Russell right. being one of them, uh, Christopher Walken. Uh, you know, there's there's been several. So, um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, but it was decided that Harrison would be the right guy for Han Solo as a result of him participating in those audition sessions. And uh, Harrison himself, who is always kind of reluctant to talk about Star Wars, because to him, I think Star Wars and, you know, his association with George Lucas, it was just like dominoes falling from from American Graffiti to Star Wars to Indiana Jones, and and each step along the way gave him meteor roles. There was an evolution right. to his relationship with George Lucas. First, he was Bob Falfa in American Graffiti, who was just kind of a, you know, he's he's not a, a necessarily a main character. He's a foil um, in the film and um, and and uh, a rival, but he's not like leading man stuff. Then you get to Han Solo, who's more of a leading man, but still takes a backseat to Luke and Ben and Carrie and maybe the droids and maybe (laughs) Chewie, you know? But he made such an impact because he was such a a great, real down-to-earth character who was funny. And a a charisma that just jumps off the screen, something that was, yeah. Didn't matter but, what he could have been a, you know. There's that famous scene of him as a bellboy in one of his very first movies, and you take a look at the guy and you go, "Okay, this is a movie star." Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess. And um, and then you know Han Solo then led to the meatiest role, which was Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. You know, top of the marquee, 
the story all about his character. And Harrison was really able to collaborate, too, with the character of Indiana Jones. I don't know how much collaboration George allowed Harrison to have with the character of Han Solo. I mean, I'm sure there was some, but not like with Indy, where Harrison was a a chief creator of that character uh, from concept to what we see on screen. So Harrison does talk, though, about Star Wars, and he he says that he saw early potential in it, which is something I never realized because I always heard Mark (laughs) Hamill hear stories. He'd He'd say to Harrison, Hey man, it's great. They're gonna make us into toys, and we're gonna have trading cards and comic books. And Harrison would just say, "Who cares?" So, but here you hear. I mean, Harrison knew that he was he he was making a good gamble on Star Wars by accepting the role of Han Solo. I thought the film was going to be successful. Actually, I didn't think that that anybody over the age of fifteen was going to be interested in it necessarily. But I thought it would be successful as a kind of fairy tale. Well, there's a callow youth, Mark. There's a beautiful princess, Carrie. There's a wise old warrior, Alec Guinness. And there's a smart ass, which is sort of a specialty. <laughs> he refers to himself. <laughs> sort of my specialty, yeah. yeah. Amen. That is it. That is it. The lovable smart ass. Yeah. yeah. You know, he, was, uh, he was a great smart ass. You know, I got to say, you know... As an adult, that being exposed to Harrison Ford playing Han Solo when I was 8 to 12 years old had a profound effect on my own personal abilities as a (laughs) smartass. I will say that. I, I, I feel like there's an element of my personality that is fueled by Han Solo. Yeah, I think you got it down. I think you got that part down. He's a great um, character. I, I love the character. He it presented is. that that real world weariness and cynicism and was just kind of shrugging about all this incredibly fantastic stuff happening around him. And uh, in the documentary, Timeless Heroes, Steven Spielberg talks about what made Han Solo work so well as a character. Han, he sort of drew everybody's attention because he was the grown up in the scene. Even though he was hot-tempered and he had this running kind of battle with uh, Chewbacca, they were kind of, you know, the odd couple. Get in there, you big scurry! I don't care what you smell! (laughs) The odd couple. Well, I guess there's no question who's Oscar and... uh... Who's Felix? Who's Felix? <laughs> well, maybe there. Well, I don't know. I do question that a little. Yeah, bit. <laughs> I, I could go either way on that. Actually, I mean, I, I'm. You know, I'm thinking. I'm going to go that the Wookie is the is the neater one. I think he's going to be the tidier one. Yeah, maybe, maybe. He's I, Felix. I did notice mustard stains on the bandolier, though. So I. Oh, oh yeah. there could be an Oscar Madison quality to the Wookie. <laughs> but it's it's you know I mean Harrison was the adult when. They were left on their own, but yeah. Ali Guinness always was sort of keeping him down a little bit, you know, <laughs> right? Sort of putting him in his place along the way. But once once he got removed from the equation, yeah, is there walking around the Death Star and trying to save the princess and stuff? It's clearly Han who is is more of the adult in that situation, no question about it. Now, there's Chewie too, but yeah, we don't know what yeah. the hell he's saying. <laughs> and I, you know, Chewie is 200 years old at the beginning of A New Hope, but that's still considered to be youthful for a Wookiee. I just want to point that out. All right. <laughs> so, uh, also in the documentary, Spielberg uh, talks about, and this is, I thought, very interesting because I don't think I ever knew this. Like, where did the lightning bolt come from? Why did they decide that? Harrison Ford would make the right Indiana Jones. They were auditioning tons of actors from yeah. Tim Matheson to Paul Lamatt from American Graffiti. And of course, the favorite was Tom Selleck, who was under contract to CBS to do uh, Magnum P.I. Yep. He couldn't get out of the contract. But that's if 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 he could have gotten out of that contract, we would have had Indiana Jones portrayed by Magnum P.I. Instead, Tom, Tom had to settle for Quigley Down Under. That was well, that's his, right. Uh, they <laughs> did devise an Indiana Jones type adventure for him. Quigley Down Wow, that's a deep cut. 
<laughs> Did you see it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Was it good? No. No. <laughs> it really wasn't. You know, once you get past just the natural charm of Tom Selleck, which is great, but... No, it, it's not. It's not a good movie. And, you know uh, what I a- did enjoy that was derived from Indiana Jones was Michael Douglas in Romancing the Stone. I thought. Oh, that I was love really the good one. Romancing yeah. the Stone and Jewel of the Nile. Those are great movies. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and Michael Douglas does sort of channel uh, Indiana Jones oh, to a great sure. degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but I don't know that what, Michael Douglas was never. I don't think he was ever considered for uh, Indy, was he? Probably not that I'm aware too, of. Perhaps too big of a star at that time, or maybe too uh, young or too old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's yeah. interesting is that they were trying out people who were all under the age of thirty to be indie. Mm-hmm. At this point, Harrison was several years beyond thirty, but they decided that it would be a great idea to cast him. And, and Spielberg talks about how they had that genesis of an idea. George had a screening of Empire Strikes Back. George showed me a cut of the Empire Strikes Back. I looked over at George and I said, there's our Indiana Jones, that guy. And George said, Chewbacca? And (laughs) that's the guy. That's Indiana Jones. And George's first reaction was, well, you can't cast Han Solo as Indiana Jones because he's Han Solo. And I said, yeah, but actors play all these different parts all the time. Harris can play Han Solo, and he can play Indiana Jones. And George, I think, immediately saw the value in that. You know, boy, that's interesting, because we were, we were just talking about Oscar Isaac and his involvement in, in, in Dune and how these, there's so many franchises now that you don't want to cross the streams on these franchises. And there George was kind of protective of his Han Solo. No, 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 no. no. He's, he's, Han, he's Han Solo. He's Han Solo. No, he can't be an individual. You know, uh, but eventually I think Spielberg persuaded him, and it may not have taken that much persuasion. I mean, George, is, George has obviously such an eye for talent that he, I'm sure, quickly came around and said, yeah, you know, we've, we've seen these others, and, and, and he's just got it. Whatever it is, he's got it. I always thought that Harrison did a phenomenal job of playing the two. I don't conflate the characters at all. They're very different to me, uh, Han Solo and, Harry, and and Indiana Jones. They're very different to me. I feel like Indy is aware of his shortcomings. Indy is, um, whereas, whereas Han's not. Han is Han's totally uh, blinded by it. He's, he's, he's totally ate up in himself, whereas Indy, Indy's a little bit more realistic and knows wh- where his strengths lie and when when he's just uh, benefiting from dumb luck. Uh, I think that there's a more of a wisdom to Indy than there is Han. I love Han, but I, I, I just I do see them as as very different characters. Well, of course, Indiana Jones is a scholar. He's a college professor. Right, right, right. More cerebral. Way more cerebral and... Um very well read, but both he and Han share street smarts. Mm-hmm. They share a common sense of humor. I've always felt. Um, there's so many similarities between the two. I, I used to think the only difference between Han and Indy was the fact that John Reese Davies wasn't a Wookiee. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not like yeah. that. But yeah. I mean, I you know, I, I I see a lot of similarities, but but really, when you want to get to the core of the characters, they are very different. They're two it's, different. It's characters. clear to me that Harrison sees them as very different. Oh yes, he he's very much, uh, very much prefers Indiana Jones. He he doesn't have a real high opinion of the Han Solo character. I gotta uh, say though. Every character in every movie Harrison Ford appears as, I see Han Solo. I mean, we could be talking about Working Girl. We could be talking about him as Richard Kimball in The Fugitive. I didn't kill my wife. Mosquito Coast. (laughs) Oh, Mosquito Uh, Coast. Witness. Yeah. Uh, He's always Han Solo. Six Days, Seven Nights. Every... Harrison Ford movie, I see Han Solo, even in American Graffiti, which came out 
before Star Wars. Bob Falfa. The, the question was presented to Harrison um, in the original making of Star Wars TV special that appeared on ABC, narrated by William Conrad. And the question was proposed to him. Is Bob Falfa the same character as Han Solo? Hmm. He's like, uh, I never intended them to be the same, but... You know. They're very similar, I think. Very similar. Hot rod drivers. Yeah. With a chip on their shoulder. Uh-huh. <laughs> Looking chasing for the, the girls. Chasing the girl, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I see more of a more similarities between Falfa and Han than I do Indian Han, to be honest with you. No, I mean, going way back... It was presented to Harrison as a question. And so the similarities were obvious. And I think the similarities between Harrison and Indy are obvious. It's just this undeniable presence and charisma that Harrison Ford naturally possesses. And he brings it to every role. Yeah. And he's such a great actor that you accept it. (laughs) You know, you accept it and you love it. And that's why he's one of the best actors of all time. And one cool dude from yep. Chicago. And a true movie star. Uh, a, the real deal. There, yeah, up there. I mean, we're talking up there with uh, Cagney. We're, we're talking up there with the, the best of the best. I mean, when you think about uh, Cary Grant, when you think about Clark Gable, I think Harrison Ford is, he's, he's, on, he's on that list. In Timeless Heroes, Spielberg reveals... His ideal casting for Indiana Jones would have been Humphrey Bogart. Oh. But Bogey wasn't available. No. Nope. <laughs> Clearly, obviously, he was six feet under when Indiana Jones went in front of cameras. So they got the next best thing, Harrison Ford. Yeah. Is that the clip? Oh, we, we do oh. have one more clip. <laughs> I thought that was I was it. ready to move on. We have one more <laughs> clip. Um, Harrison, you know, we, we heard how Spielberg and Lucas got the idea to cast Harrison as Indy. Now we're going to hear from Harrison. He's going to tell us how he was offered the role. I got a call from George saying, I want you to read the script this afternoon, please. I'm sending it to your house. And I read the script. So, oh, Wow. He said, okay, go over and talk to Stephen. He's waiting for you. And I went over, and then about, I don't know, an hour later, I had the part. Well, I don't think he worked for it very hard. They both wanted him. (laughs) Jeez. Talk about having a horseshoe up here, you know what. (laughs) But he is is Harrison Ford, for crying out loud. He is Harrison Ford, and he's got, you know, he's got that touch. You know, it's like there are certain people out there, whether they be athletes, musicians, uh, actors where it's like God or the force, whatever you believe in just touches that person with whatever that, that magic thing is. And, and he's got it and how wonderful it is that he's got this incredible body of work. I just got fugitive. They just released an anniversary edition of that out on um, Blu-ray 4k. And I, I put, I threw that in and I rewatched that and he gives a remarkable performance. And um, I don't know that, people would necessarily talk about Harrison Ford being a, a brilliant actor in the, in the, in the vein of a Olivier or a Brando or something, but uh, who cares whether it's, it's a craft that you really, really uh, work at, or it's just something that you're just innately born with. Who cares? The effect is the same on the screen. And I think that he is, uh, I, I'm, I'm really happy that I grew up in an era where he was, he was my action star. He was my action hero. You know what the secret is? Midi-chlorian count. <laughs> continental drift. <laughs> you, you, you forgot continental drift. You forgot about, <laughs> you moron. You forgot about continental drift. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get to this. Natalie Portman, how about this? We haven't had... Uh, we haven't had to feature Nat on the show in quite a while, but Natalie had to Portman, feature. You make it sound like it's such a chore. We haven't had to feature. Oh, oh Natalie. Well, we haven't had the pleasure, the <laughs> privilege the pleasure. of featuring there Natalie Portman on the program. I got to yes. be very careful uh, with this because, uh, yeah. So, so Natalie Portman was on this show with Andy Cohen. The Watch What Happens Live 
She was on there with Julianne Moore, another great actress, and uh, just reminiscing, talking about uh, obviously their 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 film that they were just in and all kinds of things. But the cool thing about this show is that they have people watching live and they're interacting with the show and they can ask questions of the celebrity guests. And so this is, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I take that back. This is actually Andy asking a question of Natalie about what, uh, what it was like to meet the Royals at the premiere, the Royal premiere of the Phantom Menace back in 1999 and uh, it's kind of a funny story, considering that he's now the king. I remember Prince Charles asked me if he was then Prince Charles. Yes. Asked me if I was in the originals. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm 18. No, you're right. <laughs> right. Um, but he was very friendly. Yes. <laughs> Oh, so were you, in, were you in the originals? This is amazing. All this these like years later, here you are. <laughs> Looking so wonderful. I, I You don't have the like, buns on your head. Uh, yeah, he's like up there with Taika Waititi. Old. What is it with what is it with Nat where Taika uh, he was he was asking Natalie Portman if she'd ever been in a Star Wars movie. He forgot she was even in one and you got Prince Charles that thinks that she's been in all of them. Well, knowing what we know of Taika, I think it's safe to assume he was probably, you know, pulling her chain a little bit. Oh, you think so? <laughs> yeah. Prince Charles, yeah, completely devoid of any connection to reality, living in the castle there and having everyone lick his boots. He doesn't know up from down unless somebody points. And uh, and he pays them handsomely to do so. Right. So, right. yeah, naturally, he doesn't know if Natalie Portman was in uh, the original Star Wars or in the original Casablanca. She, he has no clue. <laughs> He's, he, <laughs> but he was very nice. But he was very nice. Yeah, um, but cool. this is the question that everybody wants to know, and that is, is Natalie Portman, it, what are her thoughts about coming back to Star Wars? It was, is it something that she would ever consider? And this is where the audience participation portion comes in because they ask the question. We all want to know. Here are mm. Kelly and Zoe from Connecticut with a question for Natalie Portman. Hi, Andy. We're huge fans. You're looking handsome as always. Julianne and Natalie, we're very starstruck right now. Uh, Natalie, now that Hayden Christensen has returned to play Anakin Skywalker, have there been any discussions of you reprising your role as Padme Amidala in any upcoming Star Wars films or TV shows? Well done on your pronounce pronunciation of Padme Amidala. Yes. <laughs> Rolled off the tongue. Yeah. Um, no, there have not been. No one has asked me, um, but I'm open to it. Good you idea. are open to it. Yeah. 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 I'm open to it, she says. Mm. Uh, so Natalie is another person uh, similar to Harrison Ford that has had a little bit of an icy relationship with Star Wars. She's never been overtly critical, but never been like overtly warm to it either. Uh, there was, I think with, with Natalie, I think there was just a lot of growing pains on the set. We've heard stories over the years of her being quite precocious at that mm -hmm. time. She was coming off some independent films. She hadn't quite made it in Hollywood. So it was her first big production that she was associated with. So, uh, but she's older now. She's a mom. Uh, and I'm not saying she's long in the tooth. I wouldn't say that about Natalie Portman, but she, you know, she's got the, Don't she's got the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, She's she's got the advantage of perspective and all of that. Looking back on it, she sees other people returning quite triumphantly uh, to Star Wars, and she's saying, "Hey, I'm open to it as well." That's it. And I mean, you know, I mean, she's twenty five years have passed since she she shot Phantom Menace. Yeah, and she looks outstanding. I mean, she's, she's really ready does. to dive right back into the role. The unfortunate thing is, is that the character was killed off, and the character had a very specific purpose for the story. Yeah, so you have to like spin it off into like the adventures of young Padme or something. And in that case, would Natalie fit the role? Um, it, it, it's mm. hard to present. Yeah an aging Padme considering that the character was killed off at such a time when 
I knew it. I knew oh. it. I knew when yeah, you were right. talking that I would that the phone would start going <laughs> here, here off. Here we go. I, I can phone. see. I'm looking right at the ID. It says Nat. Yeah. So I, I better take this if you don't it's mind. It's amazing. No, okay, no, please Jason, do. I need to interrupt please the do. show. No, it's fine. As you know. It's crazy because we're not even live, but she's got something. She's got it tapped into Nat. the studio there. Nat. Aging was not the right word to use, I guess. But I mean, like, it's 25 years later. It's 25 years later. I know you, it happens to with, with Prince Charles, and now he's a king. That doesn't make you royalty. You're going to, what? Royally do what? Hello? Nat? Natalie. She's gone. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I, I was saying, I don't understand. I, she's got She's got the studio bugged because we're not broadcasting live here, but she seems to know whenever the subject here on I ever linked in on a private feed. It's, ah, she, I, that explains It's it. part of our agreement. Oh. <laughs> our court-mandated agreement. Is that she gets to monitor each and every episode of RFR as we record it. Wow. So we're always doing the show live for an audience of one. Dang. Love you, Nan. Just in case. Thanks for listening. Whew. All right. Well, you know she what? Is, she is a pretty loyal listener, though. I mean, she never misses a show. <laughs> Obviously, just in case we drop her name. All right. Well, what do you say we head and uh, see what's going on in the world of Star Wars in pop culture? Let's do it. Level Force Radio. You've already made that Star Wars reference. Your source for the Force. Star Wars parody. <laughs> All right, Star Wars in pop culture, where we take a look at references to the galaxy far, far away outside of the Star Wars mythology and in things like, I don't know, you know, you got your family guy, you got your Goldbergs, shows up in the craziest places. Uh, what do we got this week, Jim? Star Wars references outside. Star Wars. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we featured some uh, audio clips of Louis Lettier. Is that how you say his name? Lettier? 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 I think it's Lettier. Lettier. Louis Lettier. Yeah. Is it Louis or Louis? Oh, uh, that I don't know. I'm going to call him Lou. Lou. Lou Lettier. Easy. Lou. Yeah. He is the director of Fast X. And among... A lot of things. He's had a great career. Um, but Lewis was talking to uh, Josh Horowitz on his podcast about how he pitched Star Wars to Lucasfilm. He had an idea of like a lone wolf and cub sort of scenario and mm -hmm. was uh, a little surprised to see <laughs> The Mandalorian. But he, uh, that was, you know, a lot of filmmakers, I think, have gone through the Lucasfilm offices with their pitches. We know of Zack Snyder. We know of Guillermo del Toro. And we know of uh, Lou Lettier. And while Lou was telling the story about his pitch to Lucasfilm for what he thought would be a good Star Wars streaming series, he revealed that, yeah, he's obviously a huge fan of Star Wars. He loves Star Wars so much to the point where he personally put a TIE fighter sound sound effect in Fast X. And so I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So I, I decided to follow up on it and check out Fast X to see exactly where that TIE fighter sound happens. And of course, they use it to make uh, the sound of a, a, a super car engine, you know, <laughs> racing through a tunnel, and it's just really well played. So we have the clip. Uh, first, let's hear from Lewis, though. Uh, I forgot we had the clip of Lewis. We can hear in his own words about the sound effect he put in Fast X. Any person, man, woman, you know, whatever, uh, uh, American, French, you know, Asian person who says they're making, they're you know, in their forties, fifties, saying they're making, they're uh, making movies for a different reason than trying to do a Star Wars movie. Oh, lying! <laughs> we, all, we all are trying in a way to make a Star Wars movie. Like even like. In my last movie, in, in Fast X, I put TIE Fighter sounds in it. You know, <laughs> just cannot help myself. I love that quote uh, about how he says, you know, anybody who's in their 40s and 50s making movies, if they tell you that they're not trying to make a Star Wars film, they're lying. Because that's just how uh, influential that, that film was for anyone that's in that, in that demographic that's now in the entertainment business, uh, making movies and, and that sort of thing. Like, why wouldn't you want to uh, st strive for that lightning in a bottle, that thing that was, you know, perhaps the biggest film uh, phenomenon we've ever seen, uh, certainly in the 20th century. 
Uh, no question about that. So I, I, I love that. That's a great quote. And yes. so Jim, now I'm picturing you uh, looking for a, a copy of Fast Fast 10, Fast X, whatever it is, and looking for it like you were looking for the new Wilhelm screen uh, many years ago when you got tipped onto that. Is, is that what you did? You just scrubbed through or did you did you cheat and say, go to the, to the Google and be like, TIE Fighter Fast X? I cheated. <laughs> So here's a, a clip. It's a YouTube short some fan put up of the moment when the TIE fighter sound is heard in Fast X. Check it out. Shut the front door. B. Oh, there it is. There it yep. is. I mean, it's unmistakable. I think that even if if, if I had been, and I'm not as attuned to the uh, to the audio as you are, but I think even I... If I was just watching that on a night, I would have, I would that that would have jumped out at me. That's pretty yeah, yeah. in your face that time. It would have. <laughs> I always have great moments with my son Michael whenever there's that moment in a film or a commercial when we both look at each other with the nod of approval and we say Wilhelm scream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's but kind of surprised. like an unspoken language at this point. Yeah, you know, Leteria. Now hearing that quote and 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 realizing what a big fan he is, I'd I'd, I'd love to see him uh, come back and maybe <laughs> uh, contribute something to Star Wars. We'll we'll see. I just I love that he uh, puts he really says it loud and proud as what kind of Star Wars fan he is. I was surprised to see this name, Lily Gladstone, from mm. this 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 film, Killers of the Flower Moon. This new movie that's uh, out on uh, it's produced by Apple. Uh, it, it's out in theaters and I think it might be streaming on, uh, Apple TV at this point. I'm not, I'm not sure, but Leo DiCaprio is in it with Lily Gladstone and it's getting a lot of attention. Martin Scorsese, uh, behind the, the, uh, the camera. I thought, gosh, what does Lily Gladstone have to do with Star Wars? Well, I mean, it's just like what we were just saying when you're of a certain age and you're involved in the movie making industry and you don't acknowledge the influence and impact star Wars had on you becoming a member of the filmmaking industry in the first <laughs> place, then you're lying to yourself. And here's a perfect example, Lily Gladstone. You know, there's a lot of talk about her being a, a, a front runner for uh, uh, best actress nominations when yeah. the Academy Awards roll around. And, um, it's, it's interesting. She appeared on Jimmy Kimmel and, uh, we were tipped off to this clip from Leo, who wrote to us at show at Rebel Force. DiCaprio? Her co-star? Was... He told me not to reveal his last name, <laughs> just for that very reason. But yes, indeed, it is Leo DiCaprio <laughs> writing to us at show at RebelForceRadio.com. <laughs> and he says, um, on Jimmy Kimmel, tonight, December 5th, so just this week, he speaks with Lily Gladstone from Killers of the Flower Moon, and she speaks about the movie that got her interested in acting. And then Leo writes a bunch of great stuff uh, to us. He's a, a, a super listener of RFR, and uh, we love him and uh, all of his work, going back to Gilbert Grape and uh, you know everything <laughs> he's done in his career, Titanic, you name it. Right. Um, so, but here's Lily Gladstone, and she talks about how uh, she got into acting and and how Star Wars inspired her career. And she's very specific about the Star Wars film that got her interested in acting, and the characters within the film mm. that really spoke to her. You'll like this, Swank. I mean, my dad's always encouraged it. My mom got put in my head pretty early. What was the movie that made you think, or TV show, or whatever that made you think I want to do that? It was. Um, Return of the Jedi. Really? <laughs> um, maybe not what you would think, though. I, I, you know, I was five. I, as kids do, you get upset when you see, like, your favorite characters get lasered, and then, you know. So your parents are always reminding you, it's, you know, they're actors. They're actors. So I really, really, really wanted to be an Ewok. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And um, since I was just told they're actors, I'm like, okay. I know they're not real. I know they're not real. So if I want to be an Ewok, 
got to be an actor. Are you still interested in being an Ewok? Oh, of course, but I want to. I think I just want to live the lifestyle. I don't know that I could fit in the. <laughs> I don't do know have, that I could fit in the wardrobe. Anymore. Yeah, they did seem to have fun the Ewoks until they came and ruined the whole thing for them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was like a big celebration all the time. You know, uh, some people will argue with me about this, but the Ewoks and their like little early seed. You know, it's like there's a story of indigenous resistance, and they're arguably the ones who bring down the empire. Interesting. Yeah, they sure do. They sure do. Uh, often underestimated there, the Ewoks. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, I love that she's a big uh, Return of the Jedi fan. She was the same, well, she was a year younger than me when Return of the Jedi came out. I was six. I was the ripe old age of six. She was five when Jedi came out. Um, but uh, yeah, it made a, a heck of an impression. Uh, it seems Actually, as though- if I can what? correct yeah? you on that- Lily is the ripe old age of 37, so she obviously caught the film on VHS. Or ah, or something okay. Like that. Yeah. All right. I just want to clarify point. that. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at this young, beautiful actress, and I'm like, yeah, look at that. We're about, a, we're about the same age, the two of us. And then, thanks for that reality dose. <laughs> Well, hey, you know, swag, I might have, it might have been misleading. <laughs> I introduced it as saying, you know, of a certain age, if you right, deny, right. You're, you, you know, I mean, but still. <laughs> yeah. 37 years old, you're still in the Star Wars generation. Don't sweat it. Yeah. We're all in this together. And Return of the Jedi <laughs> but, but, spoke but, to you. So that's funny, though, that that given that she's, let's, let's call her the home video generation of the original mm-hmm. trilogy, uh, that it was Return of the Jedi, that that was the one. That 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 spoke to her, and it was the Ewoks, and she's of she's of Native American ancestry, so there, there's a connection there. Yeah, for sure, especially when she talks about indigenous people taking uh, ownership of uh, their their space. Right. <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah. So, okay, we got one more here to wrap up yes. Star Wars and pop culture, and wrap up RFR for this week. This was reminded. I was reminded of this uh, during a recent RFR Q and A by. RFR VIP Chris Turtle Wars Hagen, who reminded me that Carrie Fisher made an appearance in Scream 3. So we have the, uh, the, uh, the, that clip, and uh, it's, it's a great one. So I'm glad he reminded me of this. I haven't one. seen this one. Hey, are you? No. But you look just like her. I've been hearing it all my life. It's uncanny. I was up for Princess Leia. I was this close. So who gets it? The one who sleeps with George Lucas. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring up a a sore subject for you. Sure you didn't. None of them did. So how can I help you? Or do you want me to tell you who you look like? (laughs) (laughs) You look like the chick from Friends. That she was... (laughs) He wants to say to Courtney Cox. You look like the girl who was dancing with Bruce Springsteen in the Dancing in the Dark video. Remember that? I sure Dance do. I remember that the dance. Uh, <laughs> love that. <laughs> we, look at you and me, Swank. We got the We're moves. doing it. We're doing it. You know, I had just watched, uh, around the Halloween season, I just watched the first two Scream movies with my daughter. And uh, I we didn't make it to three. We really wanted to get to three. And ha- and so those those movies are pretty fresh in my mind. What a, I love Carrie, of course, but what a campy scene for... <laughs> For these, for these movies, that that's I, it's it just seems so out of nowhere. I've got to watch now Scream Three just to see this this scene in context. Yeah. Not, I'm well, not saying you know, that these are Fisher you know it's does. not like it's the Scream films with a Godfather or anything, but it was just like whoa. Hey, the mere presence of Carrie Fisher on the set shakes things up in a profound <laughs> way. So. But that's Carrie Fisher in Scream 3. Thank you, uh, Turtle Wars, and thank you, everyone, for your suggestions this week on Star Wars and Pop Culture. Chewie, get us out of here! (laughs) All right. As we do the uh, Dance into the Dark dance here to the theme of the closing theme (laughs) of Rebel Force Radio, thank you all so much for hanging out with us this week. What a fun show! A lot of news. As we uh, look to the future of Star Wars, getting past the uh, all of the the damage and the uh, production hiccups that the strikes have caused, we'll get into 2024. We're just weeks away from uh, 2024 and a whole new future of Star Wars entertainment. What's it going to be? Is it going to be the Acolyte? Is it going to be Skeleton Crew? 
up until this week, I think all the money was on skeleton crew. But I don't know. I don't know. The uh, press release from Disney UK, Disney Plus UK, really puts the spotlight a little a little brighter on the acolyte. Well, we'll find out. Uh, as I say, thank you all so much for being with us. If you'd like more Rebel Force Radio in your life, and why wouldn't you? You heard us talking about it earlier. Patreon is the place to be. Weekly full show video, exclusive podcast that you can't find anywhere else, and a fantastic community of some of the very best Star Wars fans you'll find anywhere. Uh, check it all out. Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio, or just head over to the Rebel Force Radio website and click on the Patreon banner there on the right rail. Uh, we do like to hang out on video. All of our after shows are, are, are recorded uh, live via YouTube. So there's a huge channel out there, Rebel Force Radio on YouTube. In addition to the library of after shows and clips from Rebel Force Radio, you get some great classic moments, bits, interviews over the uh, more than now a decade and a half of Star Wars podcasting. That's all over on YouTube. Would love to have you please subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll get tipped off on things like live streams when we do those as uh, as well as just helps the channel grow and you can uh, leave comments on our videos. We really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up. You know the drill. Uh, follow us on our socials on Facebook, on Instagram, on X, formerly Twitter. You can find us at RFR Rebel Force on X and Rebel Force Radio at Rebel Force Radio on Facebook and Twitter. Of course, the official website for all things and everything RFR is RebelForceRadio.com, the official website. Uh, but if you want to help us out, the best thing to do is just keep doing what you're doing right now, and that is listening to this podcast. We love to be with you in the car uh, when you're running your errands. The Christmas shopping season is upon us. I'm sure in the bathroom. You, in the bathroom. Yeah, we'll go anywhere with you. We we're. We really will. Uh, We just love that you're taking us with you. Uh, So please keep listening. Keep recommending us to your friends and family over the holidays as you're getting together and uh, hanging out and talking about Star Wars. Tell them about the podcast that you found, Rebel Force Radio. Uh, Encourage them to uh, subscribe on their podcatcher of choice. And if they're able to, uh, leave a review. We just have one simple rule, please. Make them good. Now do it for us. Until next time. Here on Rebel Force Radio, we'll see you. For RFR, I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember, the Force will be with you, always. Boop, beep, boop, bop, whistle, beep, boop.